Good afternoon, one and all. I am Saumya P. Kumar from first year MBA. Reva Business School is established with a long-term vision to educate and empower the next generation managers and leaders to build sustainable businesses, which will not only enable them in achieving operational excellence, but also explore new business models. With a highly trained faculty and enabled management, Reva Business School provides its students a great learning environment that fosters intellectual, social, and ethical development, and thus enables them to pursue successful and fulfilling careers. India's rise on the global stage is a complex and multifaceted phenomenon influenced by various factors, including its foreign policy, international relations, economic growth, and geopolitical dynamics. Understanding India's rise involves examining its foreign policy priorities and how they align with global trends. India's rise on the global stage is a result of combination of economic, geopolitical, and diplomatic factors. A pragmatic and adaptive foreign policy coupled with sustained economic growth has positioned India as a key player in shaping the international order. As India continues to evolve, its foreign policy choices play a vital role in determining the nature and extent of its influence on the global stage. India's foreign policy has always regarded the concept of neighborhood as one of the widening concentric circles around the central axis of historical and cultural commonalities. As many as 44 million people of Indian origin live and work abroad, and constitute an important link with the mother country. An important role of India's foreign policy has been to ensure their welfare and well-being within the framework of the laws of the country where they live. To enlighten us more, we have with us an outstanding personality. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Nanda Kishore. We welcome you, sir. I extend my welcome and gratitude to our Honorable Chancellor in absentia, Dr. P. Shamraju, who has been a continued pillar of strength to our school. I also welcome Dr. Shubha A. in absentia, Dean, Reva Business School, and Pro Vice Chancellor, Reva University. I also welcome all the present dignitaries, faculties, member, staff, and students. Dr. Nanda Kishore MS is an Associate Professor at the Department of Politics and International Studies, Public Relations Office, Coordinator of, the Center, Coordinator of Center for Gandhian Studies and Coordinator of SAP DRS II at Pondicherry University. He holds an MPhil and PhD in Political Science from Hyderabad Central University, Hyderabad, India. He completed postdoctorate at the University of Leiden, Netherlands, with the Erasmus Mundus Fellowship from the European Union. He has been teaching geopolitics of West Asia, India's foreign policy, concept of war and peace in geopolitics, terrorism, and asymmetric conflicts. He was a recipient of a short-term junior research fellowship from UNHCR, Brookings, Government of Finland, and MCRG, Kolkata. He visited Horschel University of Applied Science Bremen, Germany, on short-term fellowship by the DART-sponsored program of HS Bremen in 2012. He was a part of the International Visitor Leadership Program in the United States during June-July 2013. He is a senior fellow at Defense Research and Studies in India, non-resident fellow of Middle East Institute, New Delhi, advisor and subject export of Cohen's, a Bangalore-based risk analyst company. He has several publications in journals and edited volumes. His recent books, Reimagining India in the Geopolitics of 21st Century, has been critically acclaimed for its theme and content. Dr. Kishore is a sought after public speaker on Dharma, Arthashastra, and Indian knowledge system, apart from the subjects he teaches on geopolitics and international relations. He is currently heading a major research project sponsored by ICSSR. He has been visiting he has been a visiting faculty to several HRDC centers, Naval Academy, Goa and Karnataka, Police Academy, Mysore. Dr. Kishore has, a, has an appetite for seven languages and he speaks seven languages fluently. 
I shall now hand over the session to you, sir. You may take over the stage. Thank you for the gracious introduction. Um, at the very outset, let me place my heartfelt thanks to Raghavendra Shetty for bringing me here and uh, my mentor, Professor M.D. Nalapat, without whom perhaps I would not be here. My, all, my special thanks also goes to the uh, Pro Vice Chancellor. Uh, this morning, we had a very fruitful discussion about it. At the same time, thanks to each one of you for having spared your time to be here uh, to listen to this particular lecture. <laughs> Lot of you must have perhaps um, come across this debate, especially in the last, let's say, five to six years or more so in the last couple of years. Lot of people have been talking about a rising India. They've also been talking about asking, is India an aggressive power? Or is India a docile power but appears to be aggressive? Or is India an assertive power? Now, these are different, different, um, let's say, terminologies that are used in hermeneutics. When I say aggressive, it has a different meaning. When I say assertive, it has a different meaning. When I say it's docile, it has a different meaning altogether. Let me start off with a story that perhaps will settle um, this question that's been asked quite often to me as a public speaker on international relations as well as foreign policy. This is sort of, let's say, a fictional story, but what uh, I'm much more interested is in the moral of the story. There was a snake, a venomous snake, nearby a village, and most of the people would generally be scared of because uh, it would bite people and it was comparatively aggressive. And then once it happened so that it happened to listen to so many people talking about or talking ill about it. And once it decided that there was a monk nearby in the village, it approached uh, the monk and asked that everybody seems to be thinking that I am a venomous snake, I'm a bad person. Is there a way that I can come out of this or I can become a good person? The monk said in single sentence, stop biting. So the snake took it seriously, stopped biting uh, people. And then over a period of time, when it started being in the vicinity, a lot of people tried approaching it and it did not bite. They took little more liberty, went closer to it, still did not bite. And then after a point of time, they even started becoming friendly to it. And over a period of time, they also took it for granted at one point of time. They also used the snake for the tug of war. You know, kids to everyone. And at the end of the day, when the tug of war got over, the snake had bruises all over. It was bleeding. And then it was in a pathetic condition. So it uh, strolled up to the monk and said, you suggested me don't bite. Look at what people have done to me. What, the, what has happened to me? Then the monk said, I told you not to bite. But there is something that is fundamentally there in your nature that you can produce a noise called hiss that a snake makes, a venomous snake. So whenever people were taking granted, taking you for granted, you should have perhaps used that one. Still, there was no necessity to bite. Now, the moral of the story here is that when you are docile, people will abuse you. If you are aggressive, people will condemn you. But if you are assertive, people will respect you. So my answer is that a rising India is an assertive India which knows its capacity, which knows its, knows its strength and where it can deliver what it has to deliver. I'm sure as students of uh, business studies, you must be aware how demand and supply works and how marketing works, how you need to brand yourself. There are so many dimensions to project India. And perhaps at 
this juncture, what India is doing is all of the things that I mentioned just before, and it's able to critically also produce and do something to the world, which is not to be seen from a perspective that I'm talking about, which can be very, very narrow, what we call as a national interest. Now, national interest as such is, is brutal. It, it uh, allows people to take whatever they want to from a particular system. It doesn't bring the moral dimension to it. But what India is indulging as of now is called as enlightened national interest, which is largely under the umbrella of what we call as shared prosperity. In political theory, we talk about this. There is something called as shared, uh, uh, an enlightened national interest and sort of a national interest. But what, uh, what, what India is today is not just perhaps that has happened overnight. It's also because of its civilizational strength. There are only two civilizational states that are existing as of now. One is China, other one is India. Otherwise, most of the civilizations have lost their fear. They've also lost their original drive. You don't find any civilization existing as of now. They've all changed to whatever the condition that they are in now. They've all borrowed many other things. Whereas China and India have retained, but Chinese have gone on an aggressive mode, whereas India is not. Because from the West to the extreme East, we being in between, what differentiates us is this very thought of Dharma, which does not give the ruler to rule over the people according to his whims and fancies or pleasure. That's exactly what Kautilya in his Arthashastra talks about. Because for us, the idea of Dharma doesn't translate to what we see in the present day as religion. The idea of Dharma is multidimensional. The idea of dharma is derived in different ways. Those of you who have had an access to be in the rural part of the country, when somebody passes away, let's say he was a very good man, he used to do a lot of sacrifices or he has, um, he has been into philanthropy, he has done a lot of things, good things to the society. When he passes away, generally people don't say someone like Karna has passed away. Most of the time you will hear people telling somebody was like a dharmaraya passed away. Now that differentiates what exactly I'm trying to say here. Why even after so many sacrifices, if you look in the epitome of sacrifice in Mahabharata is Karna. Then why when somebody dies in a village, they don't seem to be saying someone like Karna passed away, but they tend to, uh, tend to say that someone like Dharmaraya passed away or Yudhishthira passed away. Yudhishthira, they, they don't use that as a very big word, but rather they would simply use someone like Dharmaraja passed away. It is simply this idea, dharma also means being good. You know, when you are just being good, that itself takes care of the idea of dharma. So there are dimensions too, because it is a multi-layered one. According to your appetite, you can take what comes out of dharma itself. Now, having said that, that dharma is the one which differentiates the governance, the idea of governance here and in the rest of the world. Because it's, the, it's only in the Indian thought, in the Indian strategic thought or strategic culture, you will ever find saying that the king cannot have pleasure on his own or the ruler cannot have pleasure of his own. He always has to draw pleasure from the pleasure of his subjects. That means in the pleasure of his subjects, when they are doing good and they are healthy and they are having a better life, he derives pleasure from that one. That's exactly what Kautilya says in Arthashastra. He says, Praja suke sukam rajaha prajanan chahite hitam natama priyam hitam rajaha prajanan tu priyam hitam. This is exactly what he says. In the happiness of his subjects lies the king's happiness. In their welfare, his welfare. He shall not consider as good only that which pleases him, but treats as beneficial to beneficial to him whatever pleases his subject. This is what Arthashastra in the very opening talks about. This thought you will not find in any part of the world. This very idea of talking about welfare, which is also called as Yoga Kshema, is not found anywhere. Yoga Kshema and welfare are not actually equal, equivalent terms. But essentially, at least it, it is a rough translation to what we talk about. Now, this is not found in any part of the world. This is also not found in any political thought, in any, any uh, political philosophy. You may see the Western political thought talks about so many things, including that of philosopher king, a Nicomachean ethics to umpteen number of things, but you don't really see this a sort of thing that comes. Otherwise, generally, there is a divine theory or people tend to think that the king means is an absolute personality. He can do whatever he wants to. Nothing should stop him. But that's not the idea at all because 
anything that or everything that is derived has to be derived from here. You all being students of management studies, you must be studying capital as well. Even that capital which is called as Artha, that is what the title here, Artha Shastra, Artha also has to be derived from Dharma. That's why in the Purusharthas we have Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. We have the four categories in which the Artha has to be derived from Dharma only. And when you have Dharma at the top, even the Kama. Kama doesn't mean lust in the Indian traditional system. Kama is a desire or even willingness is also called as Kama. Even somebody asks that I want peace, I want salvation, that is also Kama. Kama doesn't translate into lust. But that Kama also has to be according to Dharma. You cannot ask for more. Like Gandhi said that you have enough on this world for your need, not for your greed. That's exactly what it resonates. And then you have Moksha. Moksha also has to be derived from Dharma only. Now this is a thought. This has nothing to do with religion. This is something that we need to understand. This is a political philosophy. This is a bedrock of Indian knowledge system. It has nothing to do with religion. The moment we lace it with religion, it takes a different angle altogether. That's exactly what I don't want to. That's a disservice that perhaps I'll be doing for Arthashastra. Something is also very special that we need to understand and perhaps realize if today India has risen back after such long colonialism that we have gone through, not the one which started in 1498 or 1503, but the colonialism that has existed for thousands of years has been solely on the idea that because it's based on dharma, it will resurrect. The, the British, who perhaps for their necessity, came and colonized all parts of the world for that matter. But today you look at their economy. Today you look at their stature. What happened to all the wealth that they took from here? In less than 70 years, we have surpassed them and we have arrived at where we have, where we are there as of now. Now that's called as something that is essentially there in the DNA, irrespective of the governments on many occasions. It happens also by default. It also happens as a conscious effort by the people themselves. It need not require, it requires minimal push. That means minimal interference in the people's life and then the maximum outcome in the form of governance. Now, this all happens where the government is looked up to as a facilitator, not anything beyond that one. Now, this essential idea in less than 70 years, how did we come back? If you look in during the COVID, we were growing at hardly 3.1% or 3%. From there, post COVID, we have been consistently clocking somewhere around 7.1% to 7.3%. How are we able to do this one? Everybody thought if the whole world GDP came down by, let's say, um, 3%, how did India succeed to do this one? How did Indian economy become so bullish? Perhaps there where leadership also matters and leadership requires that sort of a vision that helps the people to gain what they are supposed to be. That's where the idea of rising India comes into picture. And that's where we are also talking about all these things. It's not because of certain things that we bring in today. Why maybe seven years ago or maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago, nobody was speaking about a rising India. Nobody was debating about it. Now, which has become a very, very common terminology. It's precisely because this rising India is also attributed to the steady growth in economy. How much ever we resist and say, Capital is not important or we desist because of our ideology. After all, at the end of the day, what matters is capital. That's why people may be with ideology. Let's say we have seen extreme leftists who would say down with the United States, down with capitalism and death to America. Tomorrow, when the Fulbright scholarship is offered, nobody is going to say death to America and, uh, and reject the scholarship. Same is the case with UK. UK colonized us for 250 years. Tomorrow, somebody or one of you is getting a Shevening Fellowship or you are getting a Common Men's Fellowship. How many of you will say, death to UK, they, colon they are colonizers, I'm not taking a fellowship. Nobody does that because that's an endorsement that we require. The very idea of being some sort of a power is because of our steady growth, because we are accepted to be a military power, an economic power, because you can become a military power only when you have economic power. It's very important or you have to decide that you will become a military power even without economic power. When Pakistan became a nuclear state, one of the common things that was spoken about, one of the authors wrote a book itself. You can find this on Google. It's called as eating grass and making bomb. You know, you have nothing to survive, but yet you are so marooned or you're so overwhelmed with the, with the, with the power of India, they wanted to go nuclear. 
So they went nuclear, but today look at them. They are taking balloons to fix their gas. They are running around there. They are snatching the food bags to everything. They have gone to penury. 1960 till 1960, Pakistan's economy was much better than us. What led Pakistan to go down the way it is today? There's no governance. There's no law and order. Nobody knows what's happening with their system. It's because of the inherent strength that we built consciously, building institutions and also seeing to it that we retain in whatever form that is uh, in the form of what we call as democracy. Because of all these credentials that are there with India, today we are that way. So without an economy, you cannot become a military house. Without military house, nobody respects you. Powerful people are respected. You know, this might, be, might sound like a statement from a movie called KGF. That powerful people come from powerful places and all that, whatever you want to take it, it is indeed true. Until and unless you are powerful, nobody is going to respect you. Because in the world, we have two types of countries. We have countries who are norm takers. There are also countries who are norm givers. To move from norm taker to norm giver, it requires decades and decades of hard work. It requires leadership. It also requires grit and determination to be there you are. And that's when, when you arrive at the situation of becoming a norm giver, you become part of the agenda setting. That's when you come to the front row in a photo, uh, photo op, whenever you have, a, you have an international forum or anything of that sort. Recently, you must have seen, Prime Minister was in the front row, and there was a Pakistani Prime Minister who was in the corner. Some people thought he was actually a water boy. <laughs> you know, why? We were from the same DNA. It's the same people. It's the same intelligence. After all, it's an artificial uh, artificial drawing of a map that has happened, which is separated from what we call as boundary, border, and frontiers. All three are different. Boundary and borders are not synonyms. But yet, why are they struggling? Why are they, why are they in that particular position? That leaves us to introspect how important it is to have a combination of economy, polity, diplomatic influence, military capability, and strategic potential. It has taken 70 years for us to tell to the Europeans that Europe's problem is not everybody's problem. That's what exactly our, our Minister for Excel Affairs, Dr. Jay Shankar, said. And this has been echoed not just by him, then the German Chancellor also said what Dr. Jay Shankar says is true that Europe's problem need not be problem of everyone. You look at the way they have they have used the hermeneutics. They call something that has happened in Europe as World War I, World War II. If Europeans are fighting, how does that become a world war? Right? That means simply they were imposing on us that a problem of Europe is problem of everyone. They become developed country. They have greater carbon footprints. They have greater energy consumption. They are developed country. And after enjoying all that in being positioned, subsequently they tell for the rest of them or rest of us who are developing and underdeveloped that now you arrest your carbon footprints. Now stop giving license to your mining license to many other things, have a green tribunal, reduce your carbon footprints in whatever the time, they start dictating terms to us, right? If that has to be turned around, there where these all become very important. That's where, unlike the other parts, India being a very dominant set, where we had India been a country that would only go and bully. Let me give an example. All of you must be aware. How many of you from Tamil Nadu here?
Rabha, Ramayana that is played in in the in Thailand, on their side, Lower, in the area of the place which is in the Bhumi, which is all over the area, all their customs, according to their customs only they have done it. Yet none of them they have done as much use of it because they have been hindered by this thing. Now when I speak, I really talk about the whole Vastu or the Dutch form of French or the English. None of the other of these different uh, Dutch and South Indies or various parts of India. In the east, sorry, in the western side, we also had our kingdom links extending or the kings had gone up to Afghanistan, Kandahar, so all over India. Afghanistan is still there today or part of India as an autonomous state. Perhaps a bit of this country is coming to Russia. That's also again because of the Russian Tsar Tsar had taken over at one point of time in some countries for quite some time. Except there, I don't know if you really go and say or go and see people talking about India as an autonomous power. Now, with nearly 1.2 billion population there, we are growing at much, much ahead than the rest of India, the rest of the entire continent. Now, our population in the country is going to be a little bit about to come to an end. It's not going to be in the right spot. We are not able to take care of them. It has also emerged as an economic and geopolitical powerhouse. Now, what is geopolitical powerhouse? Any of you know uh, or have an idea what is geopolitical powerhouse? Anybody? Based on geography, it is. What exactly is the Korean portion of Europe? Do you mean to say the geography which is the least terminus? Okay. But in that case, why students should in fact be studying this geopolitics want to study in this course? Why we don't study Canada? Canada comes in the top eight countries in the landmark. What do you study in foreign policy of Canada? We don't even see except for some misdeeds that happened between India and Canada which happened like recently. Otherwise, we don't even talk about Canada. Why is it so? Geography was so important. It's a combination of politics and geography, depending on each one of them influencing the other. So your geography influences your politics, and your politics equally influences your geography. That's why we may study Israel, which is as big as Kerala, much more than that of studying Canada. We don't study New Zealand as big a piece to study. We don't study about Denmark. We don't study about New Zealand. We don't study about, uh, let's say, uh, Norway. All these are very peaceful and prosperous countries, yet we don't study about them. A small country like Bahrain or a small country like Cyprus or a small country like Israel becomes much more important and we study that. So that's exactly what we call as geopolitics. Now, India using this geopolitics of its greater positioning, perhaps no other country has an ocean being named after a country, right? That's Indian Ocean. All others may have a, a sea. Once upon a time, China used to say that Indian Ocean does not mean it is India's ocean. We said, fine, brother, no issues. And later, let's say six, seven years ago, they started claiming a whole sea as their sea, which is called as the China Sea, South China Sea. Then we told them that South China Sea does not mean China Sea. Then they said everything belongs to them because there is something called as the Chinese characteristics. Because they believe in that one. They call their rice as peaceful rice. They also say that why should we accept democracy just because it comes from Europe? We don't, I don't want to accept it. As long as I'm able to fulfill the basic requirements of my people, I don't consider democracy as an important one. I don't see value in that one. Anything that happens in China, which has a particular way of doing things, you can tell them anything that you accept it. They will accept it, but at the end, they will add a tagline called with Chinese characteristics. You tell them you adapt democracy. Then they will tell democracy with Chinese characteristics. Dictatorship with Chinese characteristics. Economy with Chinese characteristics. Rising with Chinese characteristics. They just want that word Chinese characteristics to be there. That nobody defines what exactly it is. Right? But India's case has not been that way. Why I say this is that we have moved or we consider that India has risen is also partially because of the type of position that it holds as being a good power. When Ukraine and Russia happened, the French uh, president... Macron said that India is perhaps the only country that can work as a mediator. But if you look in from the perspective of military power, United States is the greatest military power. 
United States is the sole superpower. When I say superpower, a country that is capable of deploying its forces at any given point of time, in any circumstance, in any part of the world. That's the only superpower. As of now, we only have one superpower that is United States. Nobody is able to match them. Their defense expenditure itself is equivalent to few countries' GDP together. Right? All the countries, if you look in, if China says that it wants to be a superpower, if you look at the difference between the defense spending between China and the United States, that is humongous. They are technologically superior. That's why they don't work. There are two types of forces that we see in international politics. You have capability-based force structure. You also have what we call as threat-based force structure. Now, United States has nobody to compete from technology to power to military to everything from information. Right, in every field, they are superior. That's why they don't have anybody to compete with. That's why they always want to be at the top. They are called as capability-based force structure. But rest, all of us are called threat-based force structure because the way U.S. is rising, China sees that it wants to catch up with that one. China sees U.S. as a threat, so it builds up accordingly and it brings its weapons. India looks at China and thinks China is a threat and accordingly we build our weapon system. We also buy weapons. We are a threat base. And Pakistan looks at India and thinks that it wants to match up with India because they have a security dilemma. Because of that, they invest into all these things. So they are also a threat base for structure. Now this is like a chain that goes in. Right? A movement from being a threat based force structure to capability based force structure depends on how you are consistent in your growth. Now, growth can also happen, like for a few years, you may rise just like that and then collapse. Now, without sustainability, without perhaps that consistency, you will not be called as a rising country. This is very important because for even China, their character was changed when Deng Xiaoping came in. Before that one, when we had Mao Zedong, he was agitated with all isms. He did not even agree with the communism that was existing in Soviet Union or what we call as USSR. Because he thought there has to be Chinese characteristics. He said there will be communism, but that will be with Chinese characters the way he would wanted it to be. And it was called as Maoism. Right? But subsequently, he was not even trading with any of those people who are not ideologically there with him. No trade contacts were there. But Teng Xiaoping comes in after death of uh, Mao Zedong. And he said, he, in his famous statement, he said, black cat or white cat, as long as it catches mice, I'm okay with it. This is what he had said. Now, that's a very important statement saying capital doesn't differentiate. Everybody requires capital at the end of the day. That's, that's exactly what we are all here and what we do. There are things that we do. One is called as we do something for living and one we do for life. Right? For living, everybody requires capital. Without that, nobody is going to respect. You may have resources like Venezuela. Venezuela has massive resources, natural resources. But their people are picking food from the dustbins because of bad governance. Now, resources alone does not make you a great power. The utilization of the resources, the rightful utilization of the resources make it. Perhaps India is moving in that direction with a consistent growth at 7% or plus. This is what uh, an American scholar by name Ashley Tellis is an Indian, but, uh, but working in the United States had said. He's also very closely associated with the State Department there. He had said that if 10 years, if India grows at a rate of 7 or 7.5%, nobody can stop it becoming a global power, which perhaps is happening as of now. Now, the growing economic importance has translated into geopolitical influence. But what is very interesting for us is also the way India has been expanding itself and appearing in multilateral forums, whether it is G20, whether it is, um, uh, what do you say, the BRICS or the SU or any forum that we are talking about, including the Quad, in all over places, India wants to have its presence and, and something that we also need to remember that in multilateral forums, you get less, but you actually invest more because there are larger decision making and you need to also subdue your sovereignty. But whereas in bilateral relations, there are tangible outcomes, which is very, very easy. You both agree on a term, you deliver to each other, whether it is foreign direct investment or let's say the, the investments that we make in any other form in, in terms of infrastructure to everything. All of that happen only because there is a possibility to do so. Okay. But beyond that, in the other forums, you may end up actually asking for or you may end up losing much more. Like for a long time, India resisted climate change. India said that 
it might be but this is an issue between the haves and the have nots or it said it's between the developed and the developing by saying that you were recipient of industrial revolution you also had an opportunity to grow at a particular stage and you became already uh, a developed part or developing country or developed country and you have enjoyed now suddenly before even allowing me to becoming uh, a, a developing a developed country he was asking me to stop all those things this is exactly one of our arguments but but the same india is not any more arguing that in 2016 we went to the cop in in paris and we struck the deal we were the ones who made climate deal otherwise nobody had succeeded doing so now that's a changed india that we look in which is also equally important i'll also show both sides of the story it's not that everything is um everything is rosy everything is happening every country has its own contradictions there's no country that can absolutely say there are no contradictions with me everything is great here even for that matter even united states i'm not even talking about china even united states has its own contradiction every time when a communal right happens or some other hate crime happens or anything of that sort from the american congress you will find a letter coming here right if you ask back let's say the scheduled tribes or anyone here but if we look at or put a question back to the americans asking what have you done to your native indians what have you done to your scheduled people they have no answer right it's a land of migrants today they have pushed them to a corner they have shown more of more of them like a museum piece and there is nothing that they have to but we don't write and they do, they continue to write they dictate because they think morally they are superior they are still a normative part and they are norm givers and we are norm takers india is resisting that part india wants to be part of the normative thinking and it also wants to normatively contribute which to what extent it will happen is still an issue that we are talking about we generally talk about individuals as statesmen and politicians the simple difference is that politicians think of next elections where a statesman think of next generation that's the only difference that it happens that's why we don't call everyone as a statesman and we call or we end up calling most of them as politicians now there are two things that one of the statement he is a geopolitical theorist called macinda he says that the course of politics is the product of two sets of forces impelling and guiding he says the impetus is from the past the history embedded in a people's character and tradition the present guides the movement of economic wants and geographical opportunities these are the two things that drive right one is economic wants other one is the geographical opportunity that's how colonialism happens that's how we become a dictator that's how we start taking over this is the same character that you see which is visible with someone like putin he is is going for the geographical expansion in the form of trying to take over ukraine which used to be part of the estonia ussr now it says that statesmen and diplomats succeed and fail pretty much as they recognize the irresistible power of these forces if they have a control over the economic wants and at the same time also on the geographical expansion then perhaps they will succeed that's the idea that been pushed here i i don't need to talk about it but at the same time the countries are hierarchical how much ever we talk about saying all countries should be treated equal it is not going to be so all countries are not equal they are hierarchically ordered that's why you see a super power you see a great power you see a middle power you see different different terminologies being used now this is interesting on the left side everything is negative on the right side everything is positive and both to an extent hold true to lot of things that we are talking about on the left side we are called reluctant power now why do why people uh, call us as a reluctant part for some people that's that's how they want to talk about india or they interpret india's behavior they would talk about saying russia and ukraine war they would say india did not take a position they would say yeah let them deal with it we will not indulge in that one now that's a question that comes in as a very important intervention some of them think that's where the reluctance comes in they also call it as a defensive power it is never the one which will move beyond its comfort zone or it will never indulge in something that 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 exhibits its behavior as a as a great part now what happens is 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 a simple idea if you want to have visitors to your house you also need to be prepared to give away uh, the food right you can't expect that the food is not going to be consumed but yet you will have visitors now that's not the behavior that befits a country that wants to be a great part in in their understanding they also say we are too early to call it as it's still a premature part they also call it as a hesitant rule shaper which is also an idea that we have spoken about
which is called as the reluctant philanthropist. India is also called as a reluctant philanthropist. We are not party to the Refugee Convention of 1951 or the 67 Protocol, but at the same time, our record with regard to refugees is impeccable. You can look at 1959, the Tibetans come here. Till date, you don't find instances of actually attacking the Tibetans. You know, that is the sort of record you can name from Somalians to Afghans to anyone. Nobody has ever been attacked in this country and refugees have been absolutely uh, safe here. On the right side, you find one of the titles that I've used already is Rising India or the Rising Power that they're talking about. They also say it as a transitional power. It takes only some time for it to become the economy that it wants to be. Then they also call it as a determined power. And they think that it's a balancer in Asia. When they say balancer in Asia, even someone like Pranam Mukherjee had said, if the 21st century has to be Asian century, it has to be with the rise of both China and India. We don't know. Now that China and India don't interact much, whether it will be an Asian century, but still, I think it, it is very much possible in the days to come. Now, just I'll take simply uh, to some other parts of the story, trying to look at how our strategic behavior is shaped. This is something that you will find from Kautilya to Modi. All these are found as very, very important components. This is simply from the Arthashastra. Now, I'll just explain how it is called as comprehensive national power. Only when there is comprehensive national power, you will be called as a rising India or you will be able to rise in international system. Now, Kautilya in his Arthashastra, this is the contribution. It's called as uh, Saptanga, but there is no word called Saptanga in Kautilya's Arthashastra. He doesn't use. He simply says Iti Prakritya. That's what he says in Arthashastra. He doesn't use because there are seven elements. We called it as Saptanga. Now, in the Saptanga, he talks about leadership at the top, which is called as Swamin. Then you have Amatya, who are the council of ministers. Then you have Janapada, that's your human resource. Now, that's very interesting the way he has placed them. Now, you look the other way around also. If you have a good civil society, which is a constructive human resource, from that you will be able to derive a set of people who are called as the council of ministers. From that council of ministers, you can draw one of them who is fit to lead as a ruler, as the way it is spoken in the beginning. Prajananche Suke Raja. So, in that perspective, you will be able to look at that sort of a leader who will come in. So in whichever way we look at, it works into that one. Then only you'll be able to have a good leader. Then he talks about economy. The, here where perhaps we faltered. What we tried looking at is we resisted capital in the early stage. There were so many people who Chakravarti Rajgopalachari, one of the prominent uh, voices of the government, he said that rather than having a controlled economy, perhaps we should open it up to entrepreneurs, allow um, individuals to become entrepreneurs and don't bring in this uh, idea of public sector units doing everything or public sector units themselves providing employment to everything. Don't kill the very spirit of entrepreneurship. But Nehru did not listen to it because he insisted on Fabian socialism where he wanted to control the private organizations and he wanted them to be minimal but the government to play a greater role. Because of which what we thought was we will have infrastructure first and then we look at the capital. But that doesn't work that way. Perhaps if we had looked at our strategic culture, had we looked at some of our sources that has been used by several other countries, we would have had a, uh, an outcome from that one here where he talks about, or Kautilya says, first is kosha, that is economy. From the kosha, when you strengthen, you will have infrastructure, which is called as Durga. When you only have these two, that means even today in, in India, many a times what happens is we declare or the government declares that we are starting an institution. You might have seen a lot of central universities being started, uh, they have been started, where they start the course. I can give you one simple example. University, Central University of Kerala was started in Kasargod. They declared it, they wanted to start the program and they had taken a small building where the shawarma would be sold in the ground floor and the students were studying in the first floor with a small <laughs> or minimal space. Because they did not think that first infrastructure has to be built, then only you can attract good people or good students and then you can provide them what they require. But we went the other way around. We started the program, then we looked at infrastructure, which would take almost a, a decade to build. By then, the stream was lost, right? If you pay or if you give in peanuts, you will only get monkeys. That's what will happen even when you don't really look at investments as a very important component. Without investment, people don't come. As students of business studies, you perhaps are much better aware than me that without infrastructure, 
without basic facilities here from power to everything nobody will come and make foreign direct investment nobody would want to come and be here today if india has become a manufacturing hub and is slowly drawing a lot of companies from china it's only because we have provided that sort of a space from kia to apple to or any of the country or any of the companies that we are talking about they are all here because we are able to give them infrastructure so infrastructure becomes very important to create infrastructure you need to strengthen your economy generate capital at every level that is possible then you have to concentrate on both gdp and the gnp then only you will be able to move forward there where kautilya's intervention is extremely important he looks at kosha then durga and then he says bala bala also has to take care of infrastructure because if you have an airport you have a power grid if a power grid is attacked your whole entire banking system to financial system is destroyed that's why from airports to everywhere we have cisf that is guarding you need to guard your infrastructure so when you are bala that is your military that has to take care of the infrastructure that also has to see to it that your economy is not touched something like 2008 happens a terror attack happens in mumbai why mumbai of all the places such a long 7250 or 7500 kilometers of coast why only mumbai because it's a financial capital if you hit a financial capital then perhaps you're slowing down the economy bringing the mood of investors down and it doesn't become any more a conducive country to invest here and then people will withdraw from here this is exactly what the risk analysts actually do and that's exactly what the pakistan is wanted to do with the 2008 attack now there is a responsibility for the military that is danda to take care of the infrastructure take care of the economy and take care of the human resources from the human resources many other things happen something that is special with kautilya's arthashastra which also brings in comprehensive national power which now we are trying to look at good friends we are also trying to voice for them is the idea of mitra which is also the friendship what type of friends we did a surgical strike india never dared doing a surgical strike before why is it so we always feared we had this inhibition that people will attack or people will impose sanctions on us how successfully we did in myanmar we did it in the kashmir border how did we do that in india pakistan border we did this next day morning immediately after that one we were able to talk to all the friends and convince them that it is also equally important that you understand the position that we are in why we had to respond but the same thing is repeated every time you will be called as aggressive you have to do only once in a while that's like the german idea of blitzkrieg you can use it only once as a tactical weapon you can't use it all the time because pakistan's idea is very simple in the escalation ladder we call something as asymmetric conflict then we call something as subconventional we call conventional and then the nuclear threshold now india wants the india pakistan issue to rise to the conventional level because conventionally we are superior we have beat them in four different wars and they know their weakness but pakistan would not want it to go beyond asymmetric level because they know that they will get booted you know that's how they want to keep us for that to even convince the rest of the diplomatic community across the world and make countries to say india is defending itself india is not an aggressor you require the core strength that has to come when you have good friends now india can very fondly talk about the way we have built relationship from uae to once upon a time when we say west asia or middle east people used to fear always they used to have islamic conference and they would condemn india with regard to kashmir today the same west asian countries with whom we are having india middle east europe corridor we have arrived at that situation india has been practicing something called as dehyphenation policy that's a very interesting one what is dehyphenation policy if you ask me that if i go to palestine that does not mean i am enemy of or i i don't like israel if i go to israel that does not mean i hate palestine if i go to saudi arabia that does not mean i don't like iran or if i go to iran saudi arabia should not feel why did india go there we have said uh, my relation is exclusive with you you don't need to tag them together that's how with israel for a very very long time we did not have an, even have diplomatic relations i'm sure all of you are aware till 1992 we did not even have diplomatic relations then do we mean to say we never took help from israel it is not so 1962 in the india china war nehru had asked for weapons to uh, weapons from israel 1971 pn hatsa this is found in the national memorial uh, nehru Mem Mem memorial library in delhi and hatsa was sitting in london meeting with the israeli officials then the prime minister of israel was golda meir golda meir was sending a military consignment from israel to iran and upon our request it was brought to india 
and her only request, Golda Meir's only request to Indira Gandhi was restore diplomatic relations, hold diplomatic relations with us. But we did not, we betrayed, and only in 1992, P.V. Narasimha Rao did this one. We had an illicit relation with Israel, which was never disclosed to us. There was no social media, there was no percolation. They enjoyed that one. So here, where India has become much more open, we talk about Israel and say, Israel has a right to defend. At the same time, the people in distress in Gaza, we also send them relief. Now, that's an India that we see, which is a matured India. That's why I call the three C's of India, which is called as a confident, cautious. And the third one, which is most important, is called as a courteous India. It's become confident, no doubt about it. It's also conscious of what it is doing and it is cautious about what it, what is arriving at. At the same time, it is also courteous. That's why when, when, when the Minister for External Affairs was asked, when you're not able to give vaccine to your own people, you have not been able to give everyone, why are you giving vaccine to someone else? Right? He said that vaccine was not only developed by us, we did not have all the raw material. What if India did not succeed in having a vaccination? What if UK or someone else succeeded and they also would have behaved in the same way and said, we will not give it to India or we will not give it to anyone else than our own people. Now, diplomacy doesn't work. Diplomacy works only with mutual relation, with mutual understanding. And then we are ready to do something for someone who trusts us. That is how comprehensive national, national power comes in. This is exactly what India is trying to consolidate as of now. Maybe another few minutes. I'll just talk about why India is engaging in this multilateralism. Perhaps that's of greater interest to you people as students of, of, of business studies who are working on many other relations or how India gets its business or what is happening here. It is by being here that it gets a lot of business. Being here, it's able to attract foreign direct investment to everything. Now, what exactly is multilateralism? Multilateralism is when, when more than two countries are engaging because still there it is bilateralism. After that one, it becomes multilateralism, a forum where number of countries come together. What it does, it brings in stability, it brings in reciprocity in relationship. You may not want to see Xi Jinping doesn't want to see Modi, Modi doesn't want to see Xi Jinping, but they have to meet in BRICS, they have to meet in some other place. Invariably, it pushes them to talk about. That means it brings down the escalation between countries, which is also in greater advantage. It has great potential. It brings in regularity in, in behavior. It continuously does something. Let's say we would have not had something like G20. India would not have had a capacity to deliver something that what we have delivered so far. Everybody anticipated they will not have a declaration in the G20. Why is it so? Because the previous G20, by then also Russia-Ukraine problem had happened. Russia would resist everything that the European Union would talk about or anything that's against Russia. European Union would resist any declaration that would not condemn Russia. And the same thing, all the political pundits across the spectrum had predicted that India will not be able to pull off a declaration. But we did so with commendable energy and with commendable gesture. And we were able to also do something that otherwise was not planned, otherwise was not thought about. That was that we brought in the whole of the African Union, that includes 54 countries in one shot, we brought them into the G20. Now, why is it so? India is thinking long term. India is also asking for UN Security Council permanent seat. When you are asking for a permanent seat in one shot, by trying to bring 54 countries into G20, you have 54 votes that come in favor of India. Now, that's called the strategic thinking. That's called as the way you think of a vision that's not just narrow for today, but much more than what we anticipate. India was indulging in multilateralism. There is no doubt about it. I call the first part as aspirational universalism. That's between 47 to 70, cutting across different people. No ideology here, nothing to do with left, right, center, nothing of that sort. It's simply looking at the facts and, and pragmatic approach, nothing more than that one. 47 to 70 includes Nehru till 64, subsequently Shastri, and then Mrs. Gandhi's half term here. Okay, in, at that particular point of view, we wanted to be universal leaders. That's like beggars asking for choices. We did not have, we did not have food security. We did not have anything. At one point of time, John F. Kennedy had given Tharapur uh, installation for us, nuclear installation. Upon his death, we had another president in the United States by name, Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson had a different approach to India. He stopped the program in Tharapur. He did not allow it to become critical. You know, that's an important factor. They denied us technology. 
We started with the Bullock card. Today, we are launching more than 100 satellites on a single day for the rest of the world. That's his road today. Right? Every time a humiliation or a crisis is also an opportunity. Without that sort of a crisis, today we might have not had an institution like ISRO. Here is a time where we had a lot of aspirations. We wanted to be the peace builders. We wanted to be the champions of peace. We did everything possible. But unfortunately, nothing came in return. Second part is 70 to 9, uh, 1990. Mrs. Gandhi was hailed as one of the most powerful leaders, no doubt about it. Very strong leader, very assertive. All those things were there. But in return, nothing came. Talk everywhere, wage wars, do everything that was possible, impose emergency, did everything that was possible, yet economy was not flourishing. Economy was not going anywhere. We had from Mahal Nobis to everyone working on India's planning. Nothing happened. Had it worked, perhaps we would have not been bankrupt by 1990, which forced someone like P.V. Narsimha Rao to be a statesman and then open up. Imagine it's his own party's decision to be socialist. It's his party's decision to be a closed economy. He dares and he takes a decision as a very, very bold move and opens up economy and he creates the, the, the situation for which we have to be grateful to him and we are the fruit bearers of that. Today, if India is in this level, it is precisely because of a visionary called P.V. Narasimha Rao. I'm sure you're aware that P.V. Narasimha Rao had a rare quality of speaking 17 languages. The man would speak like his mother tongue. He also had served as Minister of External Affairs. He was a Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh. He had exemplary quality. And then he had retired from politics. That's when he was asked to become a Prime Minister with the assassination of Mr. Rajiv Gandhi. And he said there, there was an option for him to actually go from the Rajya Sabha. But he resisted and he said it has to be a public's choice. I have to fight an election that's member of parliament in the Lok Sabha, then only I'll come. Then he stood in Nandial, somebody vacated for him and he created a record of winning an election with that sort of a margin till 2004, it was not broken. Now that's a sort of public acceptability this individual had. He also led a coalition government, which most of us would not know because he was not troubled by anyone. That's a sort of scholarship he brought in. He was a statesman. So his time, I call it as enlightened multilateralism. That's between 91 to 99. We also have in between Inder Kumar Gujral, an accidental prime minister in the form of uh, Deve Gowda. We have a lot of people coming in, but yet then Vajpayee also had a 13 day, 13 month and then a full term. But this phase where we were consolidating is an enlightened one because nobody had the capacity to stop it. We were just entering into globalization. We just started getting the things away. But when we consolidated and we were becoming important in the international system, we started becoming reluctant. We wanted things to happen our way. That is when reluctant multilateralism comes in. From global um, summits on climate change to everything, from WTO to everything, we would go there and we were actually accused as naysayers. We were accused of deal breakers, not deal brokers, but deal breakers. Because we were reluctant. We were reluctant to be part of most of the things because we thought we were very important, but we were not ready to make uh, those sacrifices that are also important at times to become something. That includes maybe the way we looked at vaccines or the way we are ready to send our, um, our relief material or we are sending our peacekeeping forces to. There are so many things that I can talk about, including a South Asia satellite that we have started, not for intelligence uh, gathering or reconnaissance or, or something else. It is purely for weather conditions. That's how Bangladesh is able to uh, take care of itself. That's how Sri Lanka has been able to take care of itself. That's our contribution that we have made. And the last one is called as, again, resurgent and pragmatic multilateralism. Here where that is the part of rising India that we are trying to look at today in the last 10 years that we are able to achieve. Now, do we mean to say that none of those people made efforts before and that's why they were failure? But it's not so. There are so many other factors. That's all. Those are the factors that I put there. Resource crunch was a major case of concern. Agenda setting, we were not part of the agenda setting. Homi Baba said to Mr. Nehru, let's have nuclear weapons. Nehru said, we are peacemakers. How can we have nuclear weapons? But Baba had a different idea. Baba said, always one has to remember, nuclear weapon is not a weapon only of deterrence. It's not a violent weapon. It's also a weapon of prestige. It's also a weapon that is used for negotiations. It's also a weapon that brings laurels to you and it brings deterrence. All, all parts of the story are there. Why the United States that called as estranged democracy till 2000 
the same united states started after 2000 after our nuclear explosion started calling india as an engaged democracy from estranged democracy to engaged democracy and by 2006 they were asking for a nuclear agreement which is also called as the 123 agreement why did they do so that's exactly what homi baba was telling it's also weapon of prestige it's also weapon of negotiation otherwise the united states would not have respect us that's the important that it brings in that's way strategic thinking requires lot of vision lot of ideas too now we have arrived at a situation maybe because of all the things that have happened in the past the present leadership is able to enjoy some things that have been done in the past that's why i say no foreign policy happens or becomes great overnight it's a process it has started with nehru everybody has put their effort because of the limitations because of the times that they lived in but somebody else decided to take it to a divisive level. That's even more than that one. In that way, look at vision path to coalition politics. From 1989 to 2014, no government had uh, absolute majority or a simple majority as well. They always lived in Kichdi politics. It is only in 2014, the government became confident because they had numbers. And it's growing that way uh, even today. And that is how it is happening. Now, if you look at... Is it just because India is belligerent and is able to make noise and is able to be there in social media or for that matter, the Prime Minister appears, appears in social media which recently has also become viral in the name of Melody that we are all seeing or everybody is acknowledging? It is not so. We are biggest contributors. If you look in uh, from the perspective of world security, you look at UN, UN key peacekeeping forces. India is the largest contributor to UN peacekeeping forces. Whether you look at Congo, South Sudan, Lebanon, or Darfur, in all these places, India has contributed extensively. India is a victim of terrorism, but that does not mean India has been lavishing or India has been using that as a victim card to all the time say something. India successfully destroyed what we call as Indian Mujahideen, which is least studied. Right? That's a success story. That's a homegrown terrorism, which we were able to root out. Those of them who have been victims would understand this one. Those of them who have faced this one at different intervals would understand this one. India has also been part of joint patrols, training, assistance, anti-piracy operations to everything in the maritime domain. Without maritime domain being stronger, the whole of Indian Ocean, we are dependent on the trade in the whole of Indian Ocean. And India is the net security provider in the Indian Ocean. Without it, perhaps, there would have not been, if there would have been, let's imagine, like Somalia, if always the pirates were taking care of the sea, what would have been the condition? The largest choke points exist here only in the Indian Ocean. And India has been the net security provider. Last one is we are also into disaster relief, which is also called as the HADR, where we have South Asian satellite that helps in understanding earthquake, cyclone to everything. It allows us to prepare ourselves. It's not just made for ourselves, but we have made it for the rest of the world as well. Apart from that, we also have non-proliferation. At one point of time, the nuclear club said that India is not capable of having nuclear weapons. From there, if you look in today, we have arrived at a situation our record is impeccable. There is something called as AQCA network that is associated with Pakistan who proliferated the network or who proliferated the technology to North Korea. And North Korea is a threat today. It's called as a rogue state. India never proliferated anything. Its record has been absolutely clear. And India is also committed to nuclear disarmament to many other things. Now, here where I say that perhaps a rising India has not been accorded to it because me saying that I'm the greatest doesn't make sense. When somebody else says that you are great, when somebody else says you are a great power, somebody else says it's a rising India, then it's an acknowledgement. Otherwise, it's called as a trumpet. When I myself say I'm growing, I'm great, I'm, I'm the phenomenon, somebody else does, that brings in a value and that makes us. And it's all because of many factors that I spoke about it. It's not singularly just because the prime minister is popular on social media, not because he has millions of followers, not because just he has an army of people who are ready to defend him. It's because of the hard work. It is because of all the works that have been done by a lot of people in the past, a lot of people in the present day. And India has arrived at a situation where it has been moving from norm taker to norm giver. And at the same time, it is ready to be part of the agenda setting. Thank you for your patient listening. Any questions? Yeah. I request all of you to introduce yourself and keep your questions brief. Sharon. 
There is a coal tech war is happening between China and USA, okay. and also there is a war happening uh, between US and India regarding shrimps. Shrimps. So why World Trade Organization is not into it? Because okay. it also affect the people, trade, and many uh, economy and many other things. Why not uh, WTO is not involved in it? If WTO's voice has to be heard, we should also listen to their voice. I am sure from Uruguay rounds to present day, WTO has been insisting on India that stop giving subsidies. I'm sure all of you are aware of agriculture subsidies. It says that don't do it. It's a very bad economic policy. You should never be doing it. But India says I'm a welfare state. I just cannot give up on a large section of population that's more than 70%. Okay, that's one. Secondly, not everything and uh, anything gets qualified to be a war. You know, small, small things that happen, we call them as friction. We call them as misunderstandings. We call them in different, different terminologies, but escalating that to the level or usage of a word war, perhaps doesn't do justice to it. Maybe it's a misunderstanding or it's, let's say, something that has to be dealt with. I'll give you a classic example. When the Arab Spring happened in West Asia, please you can sit. Uh, when Arab Spring happened in West Asia, Saudi Arabia came up with a policy called Nitakat, saying that those of them who don't have valid documents, they would be sent back to their respective countries. And then they also wanted to implement this. When India tried intervening, then Salman Khurshid was the Minister for External Affairs. And Saudi Arabia said, no, I have to do this one, otherwise my people will be betrayed. And this was a friction between because a lot of them who have gone there to work in Saudi Arabia would have been sent overnight. And this was a big crisis. But what India did was rather than reacting to it, tried responding and it tried talking to them and then it stopped for a while. As an outcome, what happened was people feared those who have gone as my immigrants there, they stopped uh, going to work, fearing that they will be deported. And I'm sure all of you are aware that the Arabians have their own imagination of who the Arabs are and more so in Saudi Arabia, nobody came to do housekeeping duty. And in, in less than two or three days, there was garbage everywhere in Saudi Arabia. Then subsequently, Saudi Arabia itself said, I am toning down the idea of Nitakat. I will not be deporting Indians. Will not be, will be taking case by case and slowly we will implement. And it became normal. Had India reacted to it and it would have raised it to a diplomatic level and you would have condemned them that you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that, perhaps it would have gone bad, like the way something has happened between Canada and, and India. And there is a security scare, that's why we have risen it to that level. So this, this issue between India and the United States or United States and Russia, these are two different things. They're North Pole and South Pole. What is between India and the United States is between two de largest democracies who think that they are at a matured level and that can be taken care of any, any day. Whereas Chinese and the United States relation is called as complex interdependence. They don't like each other. There's no common ideology. They don't even want to indulge in anything, but they are inevitably stuck there because American society is a consumer society. When I say consumer society, that means largely it doesn't produce anything. They are dependent on anybody else. I'll give you a small example. If you go to New York City, you will find a large uh, a heavy wind coming in, uh, an American using an umbrella, it would turn the other way around, he will just pull the umbrella, throw it into a dustbin, walk up to a nearby store, buy another Chinese umbrella for $4. Now that's a consumer society. We as Indians, let's imagine our behavior, we are by nature conservative. If our umbrella turns around, we pull it back, we get drenched, but we still take it home. We take it to the one who repairs, where so many times we take it for repair, the shop fellow says that I don't want to see your face next time. Till then we take. That's we are conservative by nature. Consumer societies have this belligerence to become or they have an audacity to use uh, certain things by thinking that we have greater purchasing power. You know, the Americans are in that situation where everything they're dependent on China. 
that complex interdependency which goes beyond ideology to everything has got stuck there. Now there is a trade war between them which is understandable. But that's not the case with us. It will subsequently uh, die down. Uh, like uh, US is a convulsing nation, don't you think that will affect the sustainability of the nation? Absolutely. But Americans then, say, I have money. That's what Trump says no? when somebody asked him, why is your hairstyle crazy? He says, how many billions do I have? Are you aware of it? Then get lost, he said. Because he has money. Right? When you have money, it is we who go to the one who has money. People don't come to beggars. So, Americans are in that position, they are a superpower, they are an economic house, you know, the difference between China and the United States in economy, the US economy is 28 trillion dollars. The Chinese economy, which is a fudged economy, we really don't know the pictures, they claim it to be around 16 to 18 trillion dollars, which I suspect. Look at the difference, just becoming a 3 trillion dollar to 5 trillion dollar economy, we achieved 3 trillion dollars, we are jubilee. Right? Now imagine going decades to reach there. When will India reach there? When will the Chinese reach there? It will have its own problem. So it's not going to be that easy to challenge someone. That's why US has that capacity to be there. Why do you think US pushes us to buy weapons? Why do you think that they were resisting we buying S-400 from Russia? It's because India has a trade deficit. It's, it's U.S. has a trade deficit with us, which leads up to around, let's say, 24 uh, trillion dollars. When we buy more and more weapons, we'll, they'll be able to bring it down because we being a service sector, we are able to earn much more with the cheap labor to everything. It contributes to that. That is the only reason. Now, that has made them, they are aware that they are consumer society. They are doing all these things. The amount of food waste that they bring in can feed few countries, smaller countries, everything they're aware of. But it just gives them an audacity to do that one. That's the bad side of capitalism. But at the end of the day, how much ever we resist, we still need capital. That's the problem. Even let's say those of them who call capitalism as the worst one, they in fact talk about capital much more than the capitalists. That's the tragedy. First and foremost, I would like to thank our Honorable Chancellor in absentia for supporting and facilitating such informative session. It gives me immense pleasure to thank our today's speaker, Dr. Nanda Kishore, for his valuable time and insights. Thank you, sir. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all the faculty members, staff and students of Reva Business School for their cooperation. Thank you all.